So today we're starting the sixth essay. Yes. Where he'll go over some of the same issues that we saw in the fifth one. And so, but his concern here is different. His concern is more to save Plato from contradicting himself. Okay. Okay. This was a class he gave, apparently a lecture that he gave on, on Plato's birthday. And he wants to save Plato from contradicting himself between the times when he praises Homer and the times that he criticizes him, like in the Republic, and says so he's third from the mm -hmm. truth. Um, we saw this a bit when he discussed the levels of music, the kinds of music, of musique, in the last um, mm -hmm. uh, thing where he said, oh, you know, there's, on the one hand, sometimes they say that, you know, poetry is caused by divine madness, caused by the muses, so it has to be true poetry. But on the other hand, sometimes it's, you know, criticized as being third from the truth. And he said that there's um, different levels then. So he solved that by saying there's different levels. And that solved that problem, which was simply to figure out what Plato thinks about musique, but it still leaves the problem of like, but okay, but then where does Homer go? Does he go up there in the inspired second level, or does is he down there in like the fourth educational level? Where does Homer go? There seems mm -hmm. to there. And so it's this, and so in terms of the fifth essay, you can say that this is the problem of this um, of this essay, to, to reconcile these different things that he says about Homer. And um, although, yeah, so that's how, how he presents it. But this essay is mostly known as trying to reconcile Plato and Homer. And so at the beginning, he raises the problems and then he gives like a general solution. And then after the general solution, he goes through each of the passages that Socrates criticizes and then try and gives his solution and to why that's not an offending passage really. And when it's to do with the gods, he uses allegory usually, um, but not only. But um, when he uses, when he discusses heroes, it's not allegory. He does other things, like he situ situates it in what he imagines is the con is the cultural context, for instance, and um, or the narrative context. So um, there's uh, so, so there are different strategies, and um, the translators do a good job of pointing this out in their introduction to the essay. But we'll see that when we get there. But generally, the structure of this essay is first, he talks about the issue in general, but then he goes through the individual passages dealing with them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like, you can start at the beginning. It occurred to me. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, it occurred to me recently. Um... And the, lect and the lecture for Plato's birthday. When do you know when it is? Um, I'm not off the top of my head. Um, I'm and I'm not sure that we um, how well how certain we are. If we'd have like a a very good correspondence for the mm. uh, calendar date. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, I should consider how one might compose an appropriate reply on behalf of Homer to Socrates in the Republic. To show that Homer's teaching are completely in accord with the natural facts. So, like with the reality, I'm not sure. And above all, with the mm -hmm. doctrines of the philosopher himself on matters both divine and human. So that's that's like one goal. And also, I considered how one might save Plato from self-contradiction and show that such things as he wrote in praise of Homer's poetry, as well as the accusations uttered uh, when he accuses him against him, all result from a single knowledge, one intellectual conception, and a single plan that is worthy of the gods. Okay. Looking into these matters, one might well raise difficulties like the following. If Plato correctly sought to refute Homer and to point out variations from the truth that pertains to this subject, then how it is still possible to reckon this poet among those who have knowledge? especially since this matter of teachings about the divine class and things that always exist. So if Plato is right that Homer is different from the truth, then he doesn't have knowledge. Right. Especially not about gods or eternal things. Yeah. 
um, and uh, and so he can he can't be an authority, right? He can't be an authority for us, for Proclus and his listeners, and he certainly can't be an authority as um, as he appears to be in some situations for Plato himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the other hand, if on both these and other subjects, the Homeric legacy is deemed to be proper. And how in that case is one still able to agree that Plato acts in accordance with intellect and irrefutable understanding? Yeah. There's a typo here. It should be gnosis, not gnosis. Um, in the parentheses. But yeah, so you're you're in between a, hard, a rock and a hard place. Either you lose Homer as an authority or Plato contradicts himself. Mm. Oh, okay, because if you if you are in accordance with intellect, then you should never contradict yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thus, as I said, these are things in need of examination. Okay, among all these matters, this one in particular seems to me to demand quite extensive examination. The fact that Plato is at odds with himself in the arguments concerning Homer. But how could, for how could these things be coherent with one another when it is said by him in the Phaedo that Homer is a divine poet? Yet in the Republic is shown to be third from the truth. These things don't just don't line up with one another. Nor is there any stratagem for making each of his Plato's claims mean the same thing? Meaning the two opposite games where sometimes he says Homer is divine poet and sometimes um, the first claim demonstrates that Homer engaged in an activity that went beyond every human and partial conception and that the gods were established within his own thought. So that's what it means to be a divine poet. Right. Yeah. He's also thinking, he mentions a moment later, the Phaedra's passage of being inspired. Right. So it's not that he was uh, trying to, you know, grasp the gods in some uh, low human way and insofar as he, uh, insofar as he could, but the gods themselves, you know, helped him compose his poetry. So he had some kind of divine thought in his, in his mind. Okay. If, okay, and that the gods were established within his own thought. Okay. The second claim, however, shows that Homer was conversant with only with images of the truth, wandering somewhere far from the knowledge of the gods. Okay. Never mind the fact that Plato uh, says at one point that poetry itself is supposed to be the result of possession or madness from the muses and calls the race of poets divine. But at other points, it represents them as makers of images and illusions far removed from the true understanding. In light of this, it does not seem to wish to be safe from self-contradiction in his arguments on the content of poetry. All right. So going back, you know, the I think it was question five and its answer in the previous um, essay, you know, about, so what does Musique mean for Plato? Yeah. Uh, answers this question may maybe in the general sense of saying, well, there are many kinds of poetry. Some, mm. some are purely didactic and they're far from the truth and others are inspired. Um, but that, that general thing won't solve the problem about Homer because you're going to have to put Homer in one of the categories, right? Right. Yeah. Is there like a, a uh, more... Um... Like, like, what does everyone else think about this? Um, what does everyone else think about this? Uh, um, this distinction, contradiction, like, uh... yeah, I, um, I don't know. Proclus is like most famous for, um, this uh, attempt to 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 synchronize uh, to as it were to to reconcile everything. Um, I think the way Plato is usually taught here is, and like taught, taught nowadays, is that oh the, the the serious position is the criticism of the poets and the stuff about po 
Homer being divine, so on. These are just, uh, you know, things that he says here and there, and they're not they, they're not a consistent position. Um, and the or or that he changed his mind. And, you know, there are these many positions in Plato's scholarship nowadays that you actually can't um, cobble a, one Platonic philosophy from all from, from all the entire logs. You have to take one each one separately. Um. And amongst the Neoplatonists, so he's the one who really dedicated himself to this. There's, I mean, parts of his views are already partially in, anticipated by Plotinus, who talks about the possibility of, you know, artists producing art straight by looking at beauty itself and not having to do a copy of a copy, right? And um, that was important in later Renaissance philosophy. But... Um, yeah, this is actually possibly the most, um, well, like the most discussed past, uh, texts of Proclus because mm -hmm. it was, because besides philosophers and classists, like people in aesthetics and things have read this text and it's important for the, the, the history of the concept of symbol and things. Mm -hmm. Um, my my battery is going to die. I need to restart my computer because there's some issue. Give me a minute. I'll come back. Okay. 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 Just I'm sorry. It's I I'll, don't know what I'll happened. Be here. It's, it's, there's something gonna be bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's this contradiction. So this is what we're gonna do. Um. Therefore. Therefore, let us move on to what we have heard from our teacher on these matters when he set out. These teachings, which the Homeric poems have in common with the truth, subsequently contemplated by Plato. Who is the teacher? Syrianus. Okay. Syrianus. Um, okay. To sum up, let us go through an order and let's consider first if there's any possible way to resolve Socrates' problems. So, to like reply to his objections. Mm -hmm. Second, the objective behind the apparent confrontation with Homer. Okay, so what what is he aiming at when he is uh, going against Homer? Yeah. Third, the single irrefutable truth that is said and for us everywhere in Plato's views on both poetry itself and in Homer and on Homer. And this matter, each of them will be revealed to us as an envoy of divinities who accords with intellect and knowledge. Both men teaching the same thing about the same matters. Both being expounders of the same truth about the things that are, since they have proceeded from one divinity that fills out a single series. Right. So a few interesting things here. Uh, first, a moment ago, the the objective behind the apparent confrontation with Homo with Homer, the so the translators leave here in parentheses Scopos the Greek. And mm -hmm. so scopos means objective, but also target. And it was part of the Neoplatonic uh, method for interpreting Plato's dialogues that each dialogue has one scopos, one subject that they're about. And then everything in that dialogue has to be about that thing. Um, so for instance, Timaeus is about physics. So even the war between Atlantis and Athens is about physics. It's a symbol of how uh, forces fight in nature. Um, and so here he's talking, you know, we have to find out what was Plato's intention, you know, in the confrontation with, uh, with Homer, that certainly has to do then with, you know, what was the intention of the whole dialogue of the Republic, right? So what was his thing? Mm -hmm. They have this idea that there's always one intention that unifies the whole dialogue. Um, and now with regard to this third point, that is, it's really interesting. So. He has this view that there's one truth that's um, said in different ways by Homer and Plato, right? And so that's um, that's the kind of unity he sees between them. But he says something also more. Um, he says that um, you know it's one truth. It, it's a truth sent by the gods. It ag ag agrees with intellect and knowledge, right? Um, um, they teach the same things about the same matters. So it's not that you solve them by saying, oh, Plato talks about the intelligible world and Homer talks about fantasy or something like that. 
and um, they have proceeded from one divinity and fill out a single series. So this also means like that there's um, you know, in, the, in the elements of theology, there's this talk about divine series, about, for instance, if you have a healing God, then you're going to have healing animals and healing plants and healing stones and healing virtues and all that. And so here he's saying like both Homer and Plato depend on a, the single self-same God. And the translators point out in their footnote that this must be Apollo, right? So Homer is said to be inspired by Apollo. And they're also um, in the accounts of, of legends surrounding Plato. Uh, it's clear that there's a connection between him and Apollo, like starting, you know, and also Socrates, right? Socrates. Um, gets his vocation from the the Delphic Oracle, but also uh, there's this you know uh, dream, if I remember correctly, that Plato's mother is supposed to have had before his birth that connects him to Apollo, and things like that. But that's not the only thing. So um, it's really uh, specific. They are they come from the same god. Mm -hmm. um, so. So that's quite interesting. And we can then now move to the general uh, that he starts then with the with the first question, how to answer uh, Socrates' objections, right? What's the theory of poetry that answers that? Okay. So on the way that the divine myths is this the header are elaborated. So these titles the are given by the translator. Wrote these things. Okay. Okay, such then are the matters at hand that I have undertaken to offer arguments about. And as I said, it is necessary to hold both Plato himself and his followers, um, or as I would say, his hierophant, hierophant, no, responsible for that. It holds to me as the speaker to attempt to record as accurately as possible what was said then, as well as things as he consented to explain and subsequent further considerations on these matters. Right. The hierophant, if, if I understand correctly, it's, I mean, it's a priestly role, but it's specifically like in, in the mystery is the one that reveals the mystery, at, like at the end. And so, you know, he's Syrian as someone who explains Plato's true meaning as someone who reveals the the inner secret meaning of Plato. Okay, so he's going to just tell us what he said first, basically. Yeah. Um, now, since prior to everything else, Socrates blames the manner of the myth-making through which Homer and Hesiod conveyed their stories about the gods, and prior to Homer and Hesiod, Orpheus and anyone else with inspired lips expounded things eternally and invariably the same, it is surely necessary for us to demonstrate that the very composition of the American myths was proper for the facts about which it doubtless provides indication. So, before we, okay, before we provide an outline of the meaning of specific teachings. So, you would say they're talking about, there's like uh, the same truth about the same things, but in a different way? In a different way. Um, and he has to explain what this way is before he explains what they're saying in, in specific. Right. Um, this fact that, oh, that, that, that it's the second time that it comes up, it's ta pragmata. So it's the, the reality. It's the, 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 um, the things that are talked about. Okay. And this is also what Socrates uh, first or mostly criticizes, which is the way. Right, that they um, that that they imitate, you know, the wrong things. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. After all, one might well ask, how could these words, which stray so far from the good, the beautiful, and the orderly, and which are shameful and unlawful, how could they, at any time, come be fitting for things that have been allotted an existence that accords with goodness itself, and which coexist with the beautiful? things in which order exists in the primary mode and from which all that is has been made, manif made manifest, replete with beauty and replete with undefiled powers. Right. So, um, so he's talking about the, you know, the, uh, the gods behaving badly in, in mm -hmm. what the poets uh, um, describe. I just want to check something here. Um, 
is the, yeah, something here about the um, right. Yeah, it could also be they have their existence in goodness itself. That could also be the way to translate that according to goodness itself. Um, right, because remember, each god is itself a goodness. Hmm. Um, and that they are made, and that they come to be with, they come, so they coexist with the beautiful. And so I think that this here is a reference to the fact that each god is a henad, and that it has this primary being that that participates in it. And so that it itself is in goodness, and the and the thing that directly participates in it is the beautiful. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then uh, order is primarily there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're they're all good. You can't describe these things with um, um, with rapes and castrations and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do such things fit in with the stuff that fills the phantasmagoria of tragedy or the illusions? So that's like the stories or the illusions that coexist with matter. Since there is a whole lacking in justice and divine law. Right. So teratologia is from logos, right? And like, and teratos, which means, um, teras, which means monster, right? So it's monsterology as opposed to theology. Mm. And so the, um, you know, so it's like tragedy is, Oh, you know, depict you know depicts these things that are totally at odds with the divine because it's full of passions and so on and divided. Um. Uh. So yeah, he's picking up, I guess, his criticisms of of tragedy that we saw in the fifth essay. Because mm -hmm. also, you know, tragedy makes us be many-headed beasts, right? Have this variety of us. Okay. Um, and matter illusions that coexist with matter is. Um, so I I wonder what. Um, uh, what that means. I mean, it could just be that you know it's the broader problem that they present these gods, um, yeah. as if they existed in time and space, and they need to move to go from one place to another. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and this kind of thing. So the first thing has to more do with the um, with the moral quality, and the second to do with just you know it's a it's a it's an artistic representation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, for it would not be lawful to apply such things. To the sort of existence possessed by gods who transcend everything, I mean, adulteries, act of theft, being hurled from heaven, as well as injustices committed against fathers, findings, castrations, and all the other things that both Homer and the other poets go on about. Right. Instead, so that's the main. Um, yeah. And just to like give examples, so adultery, Venus, and uh, um, yeah, Aphrodite and Aries. Right, Aphrodite is supposed to be married to, to Hephaestus, but he catches them both together. Acts of theft, Prometheus stealing fire from the gods, being hurled from heaven again. Hephaestus is, is, is thrown down from heaven. Um, injustice against fathers, Cron, um, Kronos against Uranus, and Zeus against Kronos. Bindings and castrations occur in both of these, and other things. Bindings is also what Hephaestus does to uh, to. Aphrodite and Ares, he binds them together uh, in a trap. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, right. Instead, just as the gods, so these are the, this is the question. Instead, just as the gods themselves are separate from all other things, united with the good and insulated from inferior beings, remaining instead unmixed with everything and immaculate, pre existing in accordance with one limit and a single order that is uniform. In the same manner, with what pertains to uh, okay, just like the gods themselves are like this. In the same manner, what pertains to the discourse about them are things that transcend words, and are full of intellect. 
things that are able by virtue of the order to which they belong to conform themselves to the ineffable superiority of the gods and able to refer back to them, up to them. Right. So like what the the meaning take here of what pertains the discourse about them means how it should be, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it should be things full of words. Should uh, this discourse should transcend words even, and should be full of intellect and not like all these things that we just just described. Okay. So philosoph philosophy or yeah, something like philosophy or something even better than philosophy. But yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Indeed. Uh, where are we? Further. In mystical acts of intellectual awareness concerning divinity, it is even necessary for the soul's apprehensions to be pure of material products of the imagination, to reject every alien opinion that is set in motion from the irrational soul below, to deem everything else insignificant relative to the immaculate superiority of the gods, and to place trust only in the correct logos and the mightier spectacle of intellect. Or the truth about the gods. Right. So mystical, I mean, mystical can be just here in the sense that it's silent. So it's not something communicate communicated in words. And the actual acts of intellectual awareness are no essays. So there are these. Um yeah, you know, there's uh, uh they're just these insights, right? So these insights that you can't put into words about gods, right? You um in order to really enjoy these or to notice them in yourself, you have to, you know, uh, just could, you know, turn your your attention away from all your uh, from all the images in your mind and also um, the opinions that you have uh, from your uh, perceptible experience. Um, and the only thing that you can be following is the correct logos. It's uh, interesting. This is. Um, the orthos logos um, and the mightier spectacle of intellect for the truth about the gods. I guess the mightier, um, um, so the, the logos here might be, since there's this contrast between logos and intellect and logos and news, logos here could be very well ar argument. So if you want to pay attention, if you want to have these uh, in direct insight into what the gods are like, you have to follow the arguments and more than the arguments your noose your um your faculty for insight um this uh, recalls uh, for instance a passage in the enneads where plotinus gives as it were uh, instructions for um gaining insight into the gods and he says first you imagine the whole world and then you take away um you know like all uh I forget the, the exact steps, but it's like, and then you take away uh, the things progressively from it. Like you take away color, and then you take away the volume, and then you finally get to a purely intellectual conception of everything, and then the gods come, right? And that's, uh, in that context, it seems like the gods means intellect, but um, the it, it's basically some sort of meditative process like that. Mm -hmm. where you just stick to the, um, you, you go purifying your attention, so you don't pay attention to images or, and details, and you just focus on concepts, and then even at one point you leap beyond concepts and go, go to insight. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, so, and this is all in the way of the like question, right? Yeah, and so th th this is all the question, like this is how you're supposed to know the God, so this makes it even less uh, less likely that these poems are, are mm. how you know God. Yeah. Right. Let no one tell us such things about the gods that it, as it is fitting to say about human beings, nor attempt to apply the affections that belong to irrational and mattered substance to the beings who transcend in their simplicity the intellect, intellective substance and life. Um, being, right? What? The intellect, intellective substance, and life. Oh, right. So that's um, that's new noetis and zdoe. 
Um, so he's talking about how the Henans are beyond. In, so it's interesting that he doesn't say being here because usually he goes, right, intellect, life, being, intellect, life, being. Here he goes, intellect, intellective substance, and life. Mm -hmm. um, that might be because being is always attached to the gods. Because um, as we saw, it's that beautiful that's attached to the be um, to the good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, and that might also be confirmed by what he says um, right after that, that it's not uh, likely that uh, such symbols should manifest, um, will not resemble the kind of existence, and that's huparxis. So that's the you know, the the, um, the transcendent existence that's identical with goodness of the gods. So um, that's um, that's interesting that he doesn't mention being here yet. But the, but but it's an a fortiori argument, right? These things, these affections, they do not even belong to intellect, and the gods are beyond intellect. So, how is it fitting to um, to, to say about them mm -hmm. these things? Okay. Um. So. Right. Uh, so there's no uh, look the rational the things that are sent for those symbols will not resemble the kind of existence that belong to the gods okay thus unless they are in fact going to fall short of the truth that is found in these uh, beings in the gods it is necessary for the myths to conform somehow to the facts facts whose contemplation they attempt to conceal by means of visible screens So that's all they have to do. Rather, just as Plato himself frequently conveys divine matters in a mystical manner through certain images, though he does not allow anything ugly, nor any trace of disorder, nor any material and troubling product of imagination to intrude into the myths, but instead the very conceptions about the gods, immaculate and intellectual, have been concealed uh, in Plato's images, while representations of them have been projected like icons that resemble what is inside. <laughs> Likenesses of a secret doctrine. So too, it was necessary for the poets and for Homer himself, if they were to fashion myths fitting for the gods, to reject, on the one hand, <laughs> those combinations that are multiform and filled throughout with words that are maximally opposed to the facts, and also necessary, on the other hand, for them to conceal from the many the understanding of the mind matters that is none of their business, and at the same time to use myth mythic constructions concerning the gods in a matter that is lawful, preferring those which aim at the beautiful and the good. Okay. So this is um, still not the answer. But um, it's rather, he's saying, if you go according to Plato's view, then you have to do uh, what Plato did with myths, which is that he used them to conceal divine uh, truths from the many. But even when he concealed them, he didn't use anything unlawful or disorderly, right? He just concealed them in the, um, in the visible screen, right, in the percept in the sensible sensual uh, representation of the gods but he didn't use anything disorderly to um, um to conceal that right and and so that's what a poet should do if he was going to do it platonically correct mm -hmm. right okay these are the things for which i believe socrates criticizes both the myth making of homer and the other poets so that they don't, they use the wrong uh, screens. Right. Yet perhaps someone who was not pleased with the marvels that have manifested in their words might bring a different accusation. Indeed, there are people among us who are particularly in the habit of blaming ancient myths 
as being the cause, on the one hand, of serious licentiousness and beliefs about the gods, and on the other hand, for being the cause of seriously absurd and mistaken imaginings. They blame them for nothing less than having driven the multitudes to the present disorder and frightful confusion where sacred laws have been violated. He means Christianity. Okay. He means why are like there are people, probably other Platonists at the time, who are saying, um, why are the masses being driven to Christianity? It's because our myths present the gods in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And that's why. And this is a, an argument that the Christians themselves make. Right, where they, you know, it's a apologetic trope of you know quoting pagan myths. Look how their gods behave, but our god behaves so well. So, um, uh, as opposed to that, and and so he's saying apparently it seems that there were other people. Um, I don't think this could be um, the people among us. It could be in our time. It could also be the expression he uses could also be like in our party. So it could be like there inter there's an internal criticism of this kind. Um, and it's certainly, I mean, it's an internal criticism if they're describing Christianity as present disorder and frightful confusion. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, yeah. And you know, prior to driving them to Christianity, it gave them all kinds of wrong beliefs about the gods. So... So, so that's the thing. So that's a, like a different accusation beyond the Socratic one. This is a different accusation. Right, there. because Socrates just said that it's, well, he did say that it's bad for education. Right. I mean, it's, it's a continuation, but, the, but these people are saying this is, you know, the, the, the Socratic criticism proved true. Look at, look okay, at the Okay, so Socrates never really said people are going around raping because of the stories. No, he does. No. Just said, well, yeah. even the things we read was like it causes you to have too many passions, and you're not going to be a good soldier, or things like that. Um, and he said, or yeah, and he said that it doesn't represent reality because it's too far removed. Right, and and these people are saying no, this actually is making people worse. Right, because it's for for both of these reasons. Like one is maybe what Socrates did say that he that they rep, they teach people wrong things about the gods, right? And it also makes you actually imitate those stories, sort of. Sort of, yeah. Um. So I wonder if it. Let's does see. Us. What does it? Okay. So let's see. Uh, um, and it's sort of hard to do all the things that all the bad things are the myth. They're not like eating too much. Like, well, I mean, he, he's not exactly saying that people imitate everything that the myths do, but just that you know they they're not good people. Like they um, yeah. they don't hold themselves, for instance, uh, they don't hold themselves to a high ethical standard because you know gods don't either. And like you don't have to castrate your father. Um, to 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 attack him, you know, it's enough if you like you sue your father, and mm. that's like already uh, not nice. Okay. And, but, um. So let's see, Prophet's reply, like that priest. Uh, what's his name? Forget. Okay. Um. Now, um. Uh, okay, so that's the question. Now, we see no need for a long discourse. We finally get some answer. We see no need for a long discourse directed towards those who blame the tradition of myths for mistakes about the divine. First, in the case of those who have neglected the service of being superior to them due to the visible fictions, it turns out that they were drawn into this irrational and gigantic. Oh, he says like giants, like the uh... like the enemies of the olympians mm -hmm. right so another code word for christians okay uh impiety the old gods not the new one um without knowing either the objective 
or the power of myth-making. After all, um, the myths have put out the fancy customs that they project instead of the secret truth that is established within and utilize visible screens for thoughts that are invisible and unknowable to the many. And this is in fact a special god that belongs to them. They don't disclose any of their truths to the profane masses, but instead extend only some traces of the entire mystagogy to those whose nature permits them to return from these things to a contemplation that is inaccessible to the many. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, first thing, people who blame the myths for turning people away from the gods, the people who are turned away because of the myths of the gods never understood myths in the first place. Because... Um, the myths aren't there to educate the population about the gods against the philosopher and the kuzari. Mm -hmm. Right? It's against this common platonic position, like in the history, um, that, oh, we philosophers know the truth, and then we have myths so that other people can also know the truth, like of what they can take. No, Prophet saying, the point of myths is to hide the truth. The point of myths is to make sure that only very few people have access to this, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you're shocked by the myths, like oh my gosh, they're um, they're hiding what's true about the gods. That's exactly what the myth is there for. If you want teaching, like go to philosopher, go to mathematics. The point of um, the point of a poet is to keep things secret. Okay, so the answer is that the myths made people worse, but that was on purpose. Yes. Yes. That was on purpose. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, where am I? So, but there are, there are, they do give some traces to those who can somehow use that. Uh, exactly. To contemplation. Yes. So if there are people who consume only the superficial aspects of the mythic fictions instead of seeking the truth within them, or people who pursue the imaginary and figurative apprehensions of the truths of the myths, oh. I'm sorry, instead of the purification of the intellect, um, how could anyone devise a way to blame the myths for those people's for these people's lack of discipline? Instead, blame those who use the myths badly for the mistakes concerning them. Right. So it's not the myths; it's that people don't uh, try, don't want to improve themselves. Right. That's why um, they use the myths badly. They were. What does he say? They consume only the superficial aspects, so they're fine uh, with the thing, um, with the, um, with the surface story. They don't ask what it means, what's the truth, and or they pursue the imaginary and figurative apprehensions of the myths. So if they pursue something extra, it's just like, oh, I want to imagine this more. I want to have this more vivid or something. Mm -hmm. um, and instead of moving upwards, as it were, to, um, to the intellect and above and beyond the imagination. Okay, and, it, and it's not the myths that cause it's somehow the like question of what kind of a person you are um is here not uh related not not um yeah not related or not caused by what stories you hear like that's just an independent thing and if you're going to be a good person uh you will be able to use the myth correctly and if not not but the myths do nothing yeah so that's that's the weird thing here i mean so, right, Proclus is not being entirely honest. I think this is my view. Proclus is not being entirely honest. On the one hand, it's it's as you said. It seems like the myths are neutral, right? But which seems absurd because myths are part of education, right? But if he's giving this defense, which is no, it's how people use the myths. It's not the myths themselves. The myths can be used for good or bad. They're you know instruments um but 
I think the real position is that, as you said, the point is to make people bad. And the point is to make people that bad because of that argument that I've repeated a few times, the world has to have wolves. The world has to have other irrational animals. So most people have to become irrational. And there have to be ways that people become irrational. And the myths are one of them, right? And that that does that cohere with with the previous like with the previous essay where we have like we like Plato's we should have good myths for the people. Right. Um I mean uh so again the, the, the thing that, that coheres with I mean, ultimately, it makes all the myths a kind of um, a kind of noble lie, because the point of the noble lie is to explain to people why you have to stick to your lower class, or how I have to go to your different classes. Now, the 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 universe is the perfect city, and it is in the universe that you have the different classes, and the philosopher kings are and queens are the gods. The the, um, the auxiliary class, the guardian class, those are the daimonists. And we, our kinds of soul, a transmigrating soul, is, a pro is, is the productive class. What do we produce? We produce animal lives, right? That is the great harvest of the universe, all these different kinds of animals. And insofar as these myths make us irrational and then lead us to become wolves and bees and so on, um, they are keeping us in our class. And so everything becomes a kind of, all the myths become a kind of noble lie. Hmm. Um, there is tension here, of course, with what Plato says. But it's um, because Plato seems to have the ideal that in this ideal city, everyone is going to end up being rational or something like that. Everyone is illuminated by the knowledge of the of, of the philosophical lawgiver. And then, um, although there's this point in the myth of Ur that's like, that doesn't actually work because the person who lived their whole life in the good city chooses the bad life because they have no idea what a good life is, right? And, um, but uh, Proclus, with his claim that this world is the ideal city, since there's all this irrationality, he's going to have to find a place for irrationality inside the ideal city. Mm. And that's how he, he he does it. So there's there there is some tension here, no doubt. Okay, so that's the first thing. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. I see. Okay, let's see. Furthermore, uh, there are all the other cases with something exceptionally holy and valuable seems to be established in the gods themselves and directed by them. Okay. In these cases, when we see ordinary people harmed, we do not blame the generation of these things for these harms. So when people are harmed by holy things. Yeah. Yeah. But instead, blame the condition of the soul when it lacks intellect, a condition possessed by these people. After all, who would not agree that the mysteries and sacred rites lead souls up from the matter and mortal forms of life and connect them to the gods? Who would not agree that they remove by means of intellectual illumination all the mental disturbances that creep in as a result of the irrational life of the body? And that they eject by means of the God's life that which is indefinite or dark or from those that are initiated. And yet, yet, at the same time, there is nothing to preclude the multitude from undergoing all kinds of depravity from these things as well. The good and potential, the good and potentialities consequent upon these rights are then put to a bad use in a way that corresponds with the person's own uh, psychic disposition having absented themselves from the gods and sacrifice they are genuinely sacred, sacred, they are carried into a life filled with passions and irrationality. 
Um, okay, so now let's let anyone, let me finish the paragraph. Let anyone who blames the myths for the terrible and misguided confoundings of ancient customs also blame the revelation of the mysteries and the introduction of the myst initiations to mankind. And what need is there to talk about these things? He might as well blame the very creation of the universe, the order among the whole, the providence of, over everything down here on the grounds that these, those who have received them make bad use of what they have been given by these things. Hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, he's, he's expanding the point to say that this is true about everything the gods give. Um, his first example is the um, is the mysteries, right? And um, there and there are a couple of things to mention here. So the first off is like this is an argument that you see in, uh, till today, and like uh, see a lot, for instance, in Catholics, like people saying, "Oh, confession is bad for you because you just go there, confess your sins, and then you go and sin again," or you know. Celibacy is bad because it makes the priest behave badly or something like that. And, and then the Catholics say exactly what um, Proclus says. No, it's not the sacrament. It's not the, the religious discipline. It's the what people do with. Um, the point of confession is uh, is similar also because there were ideas about, you know, if, you, if you're initiated into a mystery, then you will have a good, you know, you will have a good afterlife no matter what you do. And people saw that as a source of, you know, of, of people behaving badly and so on. And I'm certainly there were some people who did that. Like they said, oh, I'm an, I'm an initiate, so I can do whatever. And and so he says, you know, you're not going to. And also, uh, besides that, the uh, Proclus talks about in the Alcibiades commentary, and I think maybe even later in this essay, about how in the mysteries, the moment before there's a... Um, there's like the um, the big revelation. Um, there's this attack by material demons, and that's why for some people it's shocking. It's like a, it's an it's an awful experience. They're terrified, and but but for, but some people get some good out of it. Um, and again, so you get what uh, so it produces a good effect or a bad effect depending on the person's previous um, psychic makeup. Um, and he does, he says, it's not just myths and initiations. It's also even the world, right? And the goodness of the world, because the world is good. It's made perfectly. And so if you use the gifts of the world badly, it's on you again about all these things, you can raise the point, especially about the last one about the world. You can raise the point that you raised, which is these are formative things. The you know also an initiation is supposed to be uh, something where you're you're left with a profound impression it changes you, mm -hmm. and the and of course the world you know we're integrated to part of it right why why isn't the world a place that makes it easier for everyone to become virtuous right and uh, I, it's a it's an absurd situation of saying well you used it poorly as if we had an option of like not using it or something like that. Um, and I mean, the, when he mentions like the providence over everything down here in the order among holes, he might also have, um, uh, in mind people who say, oh, the world's a perfectly governed mechanism. And for that reason, we have no free will. Right. And then, right. He, once again, people using the good things that the God gives in the wrong way. That's why all this arguing, arguing is, as I said, a bit dishonest because, Proclus also thinks that it's necessary for most people to be evil. Um, and so that's part of the function of these things. Um, but um, but yeah, that's uh, that's how I read this passage. Okay, but what it's supposed to be saying is something like... Um, if you were corrupted, like, by something corrupting, it's your own fault. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, abuse does someone... not um, abuse does not take away use. If the fact that people abuse something doesn't show that the thing is bad, it just shows that they abuse it. Right, and that is and these sort of thing. Well, everyone agrees, or sort of uh, everyone knows that this happens even for sort of purely good things. Right, like 
not entirely like you said like why why are the mis the, the mysteries which are supposed to help you sometimes make you worse also uh, because of your own fault again hmm. in all kinds of ways right I think that the The point about the about the mysteries and initiations is that they are more clearly, I mean, they're more clearly tied to the gods. Because whereas there's poetry as an activity of just producing beautiful things, mm -hmm. um, if you presented a a mystery initiation, which is this is just a a profound experience that that wasn't a genre. Right, that was going around back then. So, you know, if it, if if someone sort of suspected this is just a profound experience, but there's nothing defined behind it, they would say these are false mysteries. This person is a false prophet, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, so he's saying so even about these things that you know we agree that you know if, if that they come from the gods, there are people who have who behave badly after them, but we don't say oh this is not from the gods or this isn't good. So, you know, also the same point applies to poetry, right? And and then he goes to the whole world, which in a sense is supposed to be even clearer, right? Because the, clearly no human being made the world, and it is from the gods. And so if the world is good and people make bad use of it, then also other things can be good and people make bad use of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair enough. No, like you said, it's it's not like you can say. I mean, it could tell you something like, uh, I don't know. This works better for things that are sort of inherently neutral. At least what? Like if you someone says, well, like I don't know, drugs or something. Like yeah, they can give you access to God or who knows what. But you can also, of course, uh, use it badly or because of your preparation or whatever it is. And that doesn't make it a bad thing. Okay. But then, like, uh, something that's basically bad, maybe it can't, like, you could say, well, uh, I'm going to give you this uh, pornographic film, and it's go you're supposed to take it as an image of the gods. And if you don't, it's your fault, because why do you want something else? <laughs> okay. I mean, maybe. No, yeah, but, but that's... That's precisely yes. That that is precisely how Brock looks at it. Yeah. Um, the, it's yeah. almost like 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 Charles sometimes says, "Well, this this text is you're supposed to realize that it's so absurd and obviously means the opposite of what it says, and otherwise it's just you being dumb." Right. I think I think I think that's like a probably this is like a text where that works because Proclus is openly saying in this text that you shouldn't say everything clearly and he is clearly saying things that don't make sense and so maybe really the yeah you should read between okay. the lines and catch this fact about that how the gods want most people to be bad mm -hmm. yeah. okay which Proclus has openly in other contexts okay I think it said this is supposed to be like a speech somewhere. I don't know how it works. Yeah, it is supposed to be a speech about Plato's birthday. And so maybe he wouldn't openly say um, uh, say the scandalous thing on a, uh, when you're supposed to be praising Plato. Okay. No. Okay, now. Uh, now, I would not say these claims are pious, nor would I deem it worthwhile to regard the charges against myths that derive from the deviations of the masses as just. After all, one ought not to judge the excellence or the effectiveness of things on the basis of divine usage. Okay. Instead, it is necessary to evaluate each on the basis of its intrinsic nature and the standards of correctness that pertain to them. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, like I said, it's still not like you could say guns don't kill people, but there's still a difference in the way that guns don't kill people and the ways that like uh, pens don't kill people. You, know? you could stab someone with your pen, but... That would be like the wrong use of a pen, but the right use of a gun is to shoot someone in some sense. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Like, but that's really what he wants. He wants you to like show that the like right use of a myth is nothing to do with what it says, or somehow something like that. Right, yeah. right. Because he said, you know, the the right use of a myth is to hide things. Mm -hmm. 
which is which is a bit like saying yeah like um i don't know the, the oh right the, the right use of guns is defensive Right. No, but even more, you could say like the re, uh, this gun was produced as an educational tool to show people how dangerous guns are, or something like that. I don't know. Right, but you know, it's, yeah, it's almost like this gun is a shield, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Okay. Like, like our our missiles are a shield that protect us <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I see something like that. Yeah, okay. Um. Okay, in fact, uh, yes. Instead of necessary to value each other. Okay, in fact, the Athenian stranger does not even think that it is necessary to expel drunkenness from the well-ordered city due to the fact that the conduct of ordinary people surrounding intoxication is pointless and fails to observe limits. So that, that would be a reason to like uh, do prohibition. Instead, he says that judge on the basis of the opposite usage, which is correct and intelligent, even this, makes a significant contribution to education. So even though someone might say that drunkenness destroys both the bodies and souls of those who engage in it, never, nonetheless, the lawgiver will not, for this reason, deprive it of the value that belongs to it or its contribution towards virtue. So, thus, it is not necessary to avoid drunkenness due to the fact that ordinary people pursue it in a manner that is uneducated and uncultured. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly literally my example of the drugs thing. Nor do initiations... And the powers of the mysteries merit condemnation by intelligent people because of the wickedness of those who receive these things. Nor would the myths justly be thought to be harmful to listeners due to the disturbed condition of those who use the myths in a haphazard and irrational manner. Instead, in all these cases, one ought to blame the disorderly and thoughtless disposition of those who engage in these practices. Because of this disposition, they employ means that aim at the goods from fear, at the good for inferior ends, and so they fail to achieve. Yeah, goal proper to those means. Okay. Right. Um, the point about the laws is that the law, it's not just that in the laws they allow drinking, but that they say at a certain age people should have uh, drinking parties. So, mm -hmm. And they should actually get drunk so that they have the, the experience, see how awful it is, they get it out of their system, and then they're good citizens for the rest of their life. Um, so the, the Athenian stranger goes, beyond them like just allowing drink right there's this policy of you know people should should get drunk at a certain point in their lives so that they learn a uh, moderation mm -hmm. um and um but of course yeah and it is the 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 example that you gave about uh, about drugs although of course uh, alcohol is uh, I'm, I actually don't know. But my impression is that alcohol is not as addictive as some of the drugs we have nowadays. Okay, but yeah, but like this is like a big, like there's like a perennial um, discussion. Like, do we outlaw it because most people or half of them or whatever will use it badly and various for various definitions of badly? Or do we like um, allow it and let you and blame the blame the victims or whatever <laughs> right remember also the point that he made in the fifth essay which is that in in a bad society it's good for there to be diversity because mm -hmm. then at least there's some good people will you know do the right though we'll have access to the, to the good things mm -hmm. right right um, so like we should have some people get drunk because maybe they'll, I don't know. Right, because since we live down here in the sublunar world where things are, uh, where everything is mm, turns bad and is material and interpreted in a perceptual, sensual way, then, you know, if, if we start outlawing things, it will just be the domination of, I don't know, the ego or the desires of the tyrant or the domination of the, just the, the oligarchs of money. Whereas if we if we allow everything and even the things that are bad, well then some people will do will use will, will do it for uh for the good. Right. Okay. Interesting. I don't know. Okay. Well the Muslims and Mormons are wrong then. Okay. Um 
uh, unless they really have the perfect society where the only problem is that someone might get drunk. Maybe. I don't know. Anyways, this seems to be the like thing. Okay, that like we said. Okay, now it's still um mm, eleven seventeen. Um we'll continue here. Now okay, this this whole this whole uh like the number two here, whoever made these numbers, is just like defending against the the like not Socrates claim, right? The new claim that says that the myths are yeah. responsible for for um making the world worse yeah and that's why he also starts by saying that he wouldn't consider this pious right so mm -hmm. he's saying you know the people who are making this accusation make it saying oh you know we're we want to protect the gods we're so pious and so no there's nothing nothing pious about blaming religion because of what people pe pe bad people do with it mm -hmm. right okay no now, if someone were to condemn the makers of myths for their apparent obscenity in their stories or for the vulgarity of the language, and for these reasons deprive the myth maker of his claim to the proper imitation of the mind matters, after all, every imitator represents the form that belongs to those things through what is naturally appropriate to those paradigms rather than through things that are most opposed and furthest long from the substance or power of their archetypes. All right, so that's that's Socrates' criticism. Yeah. Well, then, if one is going to make this kind of criticism, I think it is first necessary to draw a distinction among the purposes of myths and put aside as separate from those that are described as educational, the ones that are more inspired and which gaze more towards the nature of this universe than towards improving the character of the audience. Right. So those are the two the two different criticisms that Socrates has really, right? There's like the beginning of the Republic where it's the educational one, and then it's like the later one where it's wrong. Right. And so the, the first, yeah, and so Proclus's first answer is to distinguish the the objective of myths. You can either gaze to the universe or you can educate the audience. Those are two different things. Some ways of life. Now, Next, one must distinguish among the ways of life that belong to those who make use of myth of the myths. Some ways of life are to be counted among those natural for youth or wholesome for people whose moral character is not complex. Other ways of life, however, belong to those who are able to be roused towards intellect, the universal genre of gods, the processions, the processions through all beings and the series and endpoint that has them to extend as far as the last things. That's everything right. we need to know. Right. So there's like the 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 more intellectual way of life, right? And the those that are more simple, more uh, mm -hmm. uh, typical for youth. Right. Okay. Now. Doubtless, we have separated from one another in this manner both the kinds of myths and the propensities of those who are to receive them. Let us agree with those who say that the myths that Homer and Hesiod wrote do not contribute towards education and are not fit for the ears of young people. Hmm. Let us add this fact that they nonetheless align with the nature of things that are universal and with the order of things that exist. They connect to the things that are really existent, those people who are able to be led upward to us and synoptic vision of matters divine right again this is contributes to the perhaps the, the what we've been commenting of the absurdity or dishonesty of the um uh of the essay because they are used for education right that's what they've been used for centuries for and um so it's a bit like Right, and and then there's a question like like why, if you if you're going to de defend Homer and Hesiod, you have to defend it as uh, as it really exists as this thing that forms people, right? It's not mm -hmm. people, and because precisely uh, taking it away from education is what makes it possible to say, oh, you can choose to use it or not use it. But if it's an education, it's formative. And there's less choice there. That um, anyway. Um, but right. anyway, that's that's his view. They 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 weren't written for 
um, for education, and perhaps he has some story about how they became, you know, commonly used. Mm. Um, I don't think I've read any such story, some kind of uh, Prometheus story of like fire being stolen from the gods, um, the poem of Homer being stolen from the elite to the masses. Um, I don't think that there's any such uh, account in Proclus. And um, and I don't think that there is such an account because actually there is this positive role fulfilled by making people evil. Mm -hmm. well, this is very, like this is the precise opposite of the, of the philosophers we discussed earlier. Like not the myths are for education and not for truth. No, they're for truth and not for education. And that's because they're bad right. for education, Socrates says. Yeah. yeah. And there's a correspondence here because he had just talked about how people who have, who have the wrong character make um, poor use of the myths. So that's why, you know, um, one kind of myth is for what people who have one kind of way of life and the other kind of myth is for people who have the other kind of way of life. And that that's the philosophers people right for them it's it is for education sort of right or it's for contemplation right i mean education here in the sense is means like forming character so it's not for uh, i think there's an idea that the philosopher who who approaches the myths already has a more a good moral character right? mm -hmm. so it's not for education in that sense um the this passage that follows now well, and the fathers of myth making gets uh, very famous. Okay, the fathers of myth making saw that nature adorned creates icons of forms that are immaterial and intelligible, and that it adorns the cosmos down here with imitations of them, representing things that are indivisible in a manner that is divided, things that are eternal through what proceeds in time, and things that are intelligible through those that are sensible. Nature also imitates what is immaterial in a material manner, what lacks extension in a manner that is extended, and what is established in a stable manner through change. In a way that follows both nature and the procession of the beings that exist visibly and with images, they themselves contrive images of the divine, convey them words, and initiate, imitate the superior power of paradigms by means of things that are most opposed and further removed from them. That which is beyond nature, they indicate by means of things that are contrary to nature. That which is more divine than all reason, they indicate by means of things that are contrary to reason. And that which is super simplified beyond every divisible kind of beauty, they indicate by means of things that are made to appear as obscene. Thus, they also doubtless remind us of the transcendent superiority of the paradigms in accordance with the discourse that is fitting. Okay. So here he's saying, you know, the the model for actually making uh, these obscene things is from nature itself, right? Art imitates nature. Um, and he's, um, but there are two things here, right? Because on the one hand, nature uh, produces, uh, there are a bunch of like opposites between the perceptible world and the intelligible. And so nature is all already moving from one opposite to another when it produces this um, world, which is an image, right? And although um, remember that the this we saw this was already present in the fifth essay, and there there seems to be like okay, the nature does produce. Uh, extended things, material things that are images of intelligible things, but they're still images, right? They're still similar to them, right? The hor horses are an image of a horse itself, not, you know, some kind of horse monster, right? But then uh, he says, so the same way, so the, um, the myth makers, they also produce images for the intelligible things, but then when they want to go beyond the intelligible, then they could go things that are are against nature, right? So they take they get, they take one more step. Um, and and actually the let me check something here. Seventy seven twenty five. Um, 
I want to see what this obscene is. Um, uh, right, yeah, it's ugly in, gen in general. Because I am uh, shame, base, deformed. Because when he talks about things that are super simplified, he could have uh, in mind like the intelligible living being, which I mentioned is identified by Proclus with Phanes, which appears to be this monstrous creature, right? With a, with a snake and a with a snake on its head and wings and 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 the head of a bull and things like that um and that would be and so it's something very um multiple and i and so i thought that he might think of that when he's thinking about the something super simplified beyond every divisible beauty and but there's not a direct reference here mm -hmm. um but In general, this is like the the move, uh, Prox's main move to to defend mythic obscenity, right? Saying that when you break the natural laws, you're showing something that's beyond the intelligible. Um. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, let's continue the rest next week, or no? Next week um, then is. is Pesach, right? Probably next week won't work, but the week after, I guess. Okay, so the fifth? Mm, where am I? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good it's a good it's a good stopping point.